I am indeed a science fiction writer, and as a species, we are not known for our sartorial splendor. But I am today wearing a tie, which is very unusual for me. And the reason I'm wearing a tie is so that I can wear this tie clasp. The tie clasp has on it a trilobite. A trilobite. Who knows what a trilobite is? It's an arthropod that first appeared about 500 million years ago, half a billion years ago. The first complex animal to have eyes to be able to see. Richard Forty, a British paleontologist, wrote a wonderful history of trilobites entitled Trilobite! Exclamation point, Eyewitness to Evolution. And it's this notion to lead into my topic of being an eyewitness that I want to dwell on for a little bit here. Because the trilobite saw the first uh, couple of hundred million years of evolution on Earth, and they're gone. Trilobites are extinct. We no longer have access. There's no living memory of what happened that long ago. Just this past week, the last surviving World War I veteran passed away, a woman named Florence Green, passed away at the ripe old age, a wonderful age, of 110. There is nobody left alive on planet Earth who can attest to what it was like to be a veteran in the war to end all wars, to be a veteran of the Great War, to be a veteran of the war that was supposed to stop us from doing that foolish thing ever again. We're going to lose other significant people as time goes by. It won't be that long until we'll have to say the Kaddish for the last survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. That will pass out of living memory. The worst thing humanity has ever done will pass out of living memory. This December of 2012 will be the 40th anniversary of what I, as a science fiction writer, and perhaps a biased view, think of as the best thing Humanity, the end of the best thing humanity had ever done. Just in December of 1972, the last man walked on the moon. 40 years ago. So these guys, the astronauts, are getting on in years. At some point, we're no longer going to have anybody who can gainsay the moon hoaxers, who'll be able to say, no, I was there. I did it. I walked on the moon. I stood in one-sixth gravity. I looked up through a sky that had no air in it and saw our planet as a fragile ball. When we talk about memory over a long term, what we're really talking about is wisdom. What we're really talking about is the ability to have perspective, to see things in a way that you can't when you only have short little snapshots of them. I started way, way in the past with trilobites. I want to move up only to about uh, the last 100,000 years and talk a little bit about how important perspective is. We are Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, Carl Linnaeus, who gave us our name, was either being ironic or was being awfully optimistic in deciding to call us man, or we'll say today people, people of wisdom, people of wisdom, because we don't often live up to that name, but that is in fact our official name as a species, Homo sapiens, and for those who think that Neanderthals are a subspecies of Homo sapiens, we add Sapiens again, Homo sapiens sapiens. It's like New York, New York, the city's so nice, we named it twice. Homo sapiens sapiens, the people so nice, we named them twice. We are uh, here, and all the other kinds of genus Homo, other kinds of humanity that ever existed, are no longer here. Homo neanderthalensis, or perhaps Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, depending where you sit in the current taxonomic debates about these things, is extinct. Why did they die out? Why did we survive to the present day? It's a profound question. It's one, in fact, that I've addressed in my science fiction novels. Did a trilogy, Hominids, Humans, and Hybrids, about an alternate Earth where Neanderthals survived to the present day and we did not. What is the re reason that, they sur that we survived and they didn't survive in this reality? Well, one very good answer is that in ancient times, life was, and one of the earlier speakers quoted Thomas Hobbes, I'm going to quote Thomas Hobbes again, the condition of man was solitary, nasty, brutish, and short, life of man, nasty, brutish, and short, didn't live a long time. Neanderthals, on average, lived to be about 28 years old. Early Homo sapiens, our ancestors, lived to be about 28 years old. And then something happened, and we started living a little longer, 29 years old. 
30 years old, 31, 32 years old. That turned out to be a very magic figure, 32. We don't think of 32 as an old age today, but it is a significant age because what happens by the time you're 32 is not only are you alive, not only are your children alive, but your children's children are alive. We invented the notion of grandparents. The Neanderthals probably were capable of speech, probably did not have a word for that relationship. It would be so vanishingly unusual for there to be a grandchild in a Neanderthal community, they wouldn't have a name for it. We had the ability to look back farther in time than they had, and we were able to see when you're a hunter-gatherer, and everybody was a hunter-gatherer until 11,500 years ago, which is when we invented agriculture. Prior to that, it didn't matter if you're Neanderthal or our kind of Homo sapiens, you were a hunter-gatherer. Everybody was a hunter-gatherer, and the number one most valuable thing you can have as a hunter-gatherer is long-term memory. The more you can remember about migration patterns of big animals, the more you can remember about how plants respond to the alternation of a dry season with a wet season, where they're going to be likely to be found flourishing and where going after them is not going to literally bear fruit, is the key to success as a hunter-gatherer. The more seasons you remember, the better you're going to be at doing it. Longevity, a little bit of additional longevity, is probably a key ingredient for why we are here and our brow-ridged brainier cousins who had bigger brains than we had are no longer here. They didn't have the long-term wisdom. They were not witnesses to a long-term uh, history of things. Now, all of this is fun to uh, talk about, but what does it mean for us? Well, the title of my talk is, I take it from my great friend Spider Robinson, another science fiction writer, lives in uh, British Columbia, to live forever or die trying, to live forever or die trying. We had an earlier talk today from the chief information officer of NASA who suggested that the first people to walk on Mars are already alive. I think that's absolutely true, no question about that. They're, in, as she said, probably preschool, nursery school. Uh, if Newt Gingrich has his way, they're already PhDs out of MIT, but <laughs> they're, they're alive and, and, and with us. Also with us, I think, are the first people who are going to get more than the natural human lifespan. The natural human lifespan, the longest the human organism can endure under ideal circumstances in the developed world with first-class healthcare and first-class nutrition is 110 years as uh, 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 Mrs. Green who passed away, Florence Green who passed away, the uh, World War I veteran lived to, 115, maybe 120, no more than that. In fact, we have good arguments for why that is the maximum lifespan of the human species. Uh, we have chromosomes, chromosomes reproduce. Uh, as they reproduce, they get shorter each time they reproduce. Little bits of junk get whittled away at the ends of the strands of DNA. By junk, I mean useless DNA. And at some point, those useless little end caps disappear and you start eating into the valuable DNA and the cell has what they call programmed cell death. It's not gonna survive. So, we have this necessity, almost, of passing away in terms of our natural condition. But we are not natural people anymore. We are tool-using animals. We are children of science and technology. We have the capability of extending our lifespan. We know the laundry list. One of those things that I mentioned is the shortening of our telomeres. There are seven or eight significant things that go wrong and cause aging. Some are mechanical, the joints wear out. Some are biochemical, free radicals build up in your cells. Uh, some are related to uh, the interconnections in your neurons in your brain. We know what they are. Once you define a problem, it's only a question of time before you solve the problem. And the rate of technological advancement is expanding at uh, an ever-increasing rate. What we did in the last 10 years is not a good judge for what we'll do in the next 10 years. We'll do much more in the next 10, and in the 10 after that, much more than we did in the decade to come. We're going to, now that we've defined the problems, solve all these problems. We are going to reach a point where we can treat the disease, the disease that we call aging. When we start treating it, we don't have to solve it in its entirety, and this is the key point. Right now, the average lifespan of people in the Western developed world 
is extending by about three months per calendar year. Three months per calendar year. That lifespan increase has been increasing over time. So at some point, it's going to shift to be four months per calendar year, five months per calendar year. You can see the rest is going, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then you hit where the average lifespan of a human being is increasing by 13 months for every year that passes. Uh, the great senescence researcher Aubrey de Grey, great name, de Grey of the Grey, uh, refers to this as escape velocity, the point where we take off uh, towards this goal of living forever. We will start uh, being able to live long enough for the next breakthrough that'll keep us living out even longer, for the next breakthrough, on and on and on, add quite literally infinitum, quite literally, quite plausibly, forever. Now, why is that important? One could argue that's the most narcissistic thing possible to desire, living forever. And I remember speaking when I was young, I was, uh, had the great privilege to do some interviews with science fiction greats, great editors and writers um, for the CBC, for their Ideas series on CBC Radio. And I interviewed the great editor Judith Merrill. I was in my 20s, she was in her 70s. I said, Judith, you write about immortality, but wouldn't that be boring? She was getting near the end of her life, and she looked at me with the steely gray eyes that she had, and she said, only somebody as young as you could say that immortality would be boring, because she was conscious of how close she was to the end of her natural span and how much there was that she still wanted to do. So there certainly is a personal desire for living longer, as long as it's a healthy existence. There's not a person in this room who doesn't want to, if they have children, see their children graduate from college, see their children get married. Not a person in this room doesn't want to meet their grandchildren and so forth. And it goes on and on. You have a desire to go onward. But beside that, setting all of that aside, it's important that we extend the human lifespan for perspective so that we have a better grasp of history so that we see where we came from. It's what got us to survive when the Neanderthals did not survive, was this ability to live a little bit longer than they did. Maybe it was we had a slightly more nutritious diet, who knows what it was, but we lived a little bit longer, we started having multi-generational wisdom, we started having old people who knew a lot. And our problems today, so often, are our failure of memory, our failure to remember now, nobody, Nobody remembers what it's like to have been a veteran in World War I. It's gone. Certainly nobody remembers what it was like to be in the American Civil War. That's gone. Uh, we're going to, as I say, lose these other key groups as time goes by, and we keep making the same mistakes. The biggest problem that humanity faces right now is climate change. Climate change is something that we debate about largely because none of us live long enough to see climate changing in the terms that climatologists talk about. We talk about, well, I remember when I was a kid, as if, for some of the people in the audience, that's only 10 years ago, for others in the audience, that's 60 or 70 years ago, and think that that's a big hunk of time. It isn't a big hunk of time. Not only with the problem of climate change, but all of the conundrums that we've never been able to solve still plague us because nobody has ever spent more than a few decades trying to solve any of the big problems that face humanity. The problems of how to make an economic system that actually doesn't periodically collapse. The problems of how to protect an environment and live sustainably within that environment. The problems of how to have world peace and so forth. None of those things have ever been the object of attention for more than a handful of decades until somebody else has come in and had to start over from scratch. When we get a larger degree of perspective, when we get a longer lifespan, when we get the ability that medical science will give us in the next few decades to be eyewitnesses not just to evolution, not just to history, but to the future, we will be able to usher in an era that is going to be the most wonderful era of human existence. One of the reasons we're so uh, profligate with resources is we know that, yes, they're running out, but they're not running out before we will run out of time. But if we have, if we are living long enough to live forever, then stewardship of our resources now, protecting our neighbors now, feeding our friends, feeding our enemies, making sure that our enemies become our friends, learning to live in peace and harmony become survival characteristics 
for the whole species. And that's the future that I'm very much looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.